Hello, everyone, and a very warm welcome to our third future seminar that we are calling Visions and Decisions. Today, we are turning our focus to a recent initiative by the Carlsberg Foundation to co-create a vision for Denmark 2050, and we had the honor of facilitating the process. My name is Simon, and I'm a senior advisor and futurist here at the Institute. And this vision initiative is not only something that I'm proud of personally, but it's something that is really close to our hearts at SIFS as an independent non-profit futures think tank that's been working for the betterment of society for more than 50 years. Today's event is actually an exclusive event for our members and partners. So I'm very happy to see all of you here. And we plan to host four annual future seminars that are exclusive for members and partners. I very much hope you'll be hanging in there for the next hour or so because we'll Actually, we, 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 we've planned for a mixture of shorter presentations as well as a few activities that we hope all of you to participate in. We'll be using Miro collaboration tool for the activities and we'll give you the link in the chat eventually. But I'll get back to that a little later. So let's get started. Today we have two parts that we need to get, to get through. I'll be guiding you through part one, where we'll talk about how to work with visioning by leveraging foresight techniques. And we'll also have a closer look in the engine room on this very exciting and very challenging Vision 2050 process. Then we'll have the first activity before our beloved CEO, Dasha, will present some of the main outcomes and aspirations of the vision. Finally, we'll round off today's seminar with a second exercise. So hang in there and buckle your seat belts. We have a packed program, so let's get straight to it. Countries need long-term strategic visions to help them make better decisions today. In a nutshell, a vision in, is this compelling image of preferred futures that sets out the highest aspirations in a clear, in a powerful, and in a confident way. And when we talk about visions for a nation, it describes a future state that the government and key actors in society, and of course, the people as well, are committed to creating. So it's about having a desirable and viable direction, which includes setting goals and mileposts. Visions, of course, are most powerful when they reflect deeper values uh, and purpose of the people. But a future vision, especially if we're looking all the way towards 2050, is never going to be very useful if it's based on what I would call path-dependent thinking about the future. We see way too often that leaders at every level usually tend to believe their past experience is a fairly reliable guide to the future. But in practice, more often than not, this means that visions and decisions tend to be, ba tend to be based on obsolete and on misguided assumptions and maybe even judgmental biases regarding the future. And this is exactly where foresight as a lever for visioning comes into the picture. Let's have a look at a very central concept of future studies and foresight, which we call the futures cone. The futures cone is a fundamental figure when talking about future studies and foresight. And many of you might be familiar with it already because it's a figure that's widely used out there. In its essence, it's a conceptual tool that we use to help depict the idea that there are multiple futures out there and that the future is not predefined. It also helps us depict that the further we move away from the present, the bigger the outcome space becomes. Hence, we can say that the future is inherently unpredictable and many factors may come together, uh, come together in very complex ways to create surprising futures in what we would say is a non-linear world. So we talk about probable futures, we talk about plausible futures, possible futures, and even preferable futures. So a vision is understood as a description of a desirable or preferable future in comparison to the plausible futures that we often focus on when working with foresight to try and understand how things might unfold. And this is exactly why a very important step in any visioning process is to develop a clear understanding of future 
visionary conditions, how the future might unfold, so to say. Because we cannot develop tomorrow's visions just by extrapolating our current society, right? So we need to consider and understand the forces that are shaping the future as well as the challenges and opportunities that might arise in the future and that we might not even have considered today. So when connecting foresight and visioning, we'll start by exploring plausible futures and understand what drives change to help us understand how the future might unfold. This is to make sure that our vision doesn't end up as conjecture and disconnected from purpose, you would say. Right. We are definitely starting to see more and more nations working proactively with foresight to support their visioning and policy action. And just to exemplify, I've brought you four, expiring, uh, four inspiring examples related to how foresight activities supports policymaking and visioning at nation level. Let's first look towards Wales. They've implemented a Well-Being of Future Generations Act and even appointed the world, world's first Minister for Future Generations. Sophie Howe is her name. She's the one you see on your picture. They've formulated a shared vision for the future of the country, which they call well-being goals. And there's seven of the well-being goals. And together with that, they have a bunch of milestones to get them to the vision. Very inspiring. We are also seeing that the, the European Commission is ramping up on strategic foresight and, and how it can and should be used to support policymaking and visioning for a greener, more digital and more fair Europe. The Commission released their first ever strategic foresight report in 2020, followed by the most recent one in 2021. And it, this, this was to create a basis to better steer European Union strategic choices and the strategic choices and visioning of member states. Then we have Finland, who as a country, is, is they are known to be at the forefront with future studies and foresight, have been that for many years. They actually have a government foresight group in place, a foresight unit directly under the prime minister's office with the sole purpose of coordinating national foresight activities in relation to the future of the country. And then, of course, we have Singapore that's been proactively using, for fu uh, using the future to inform policymaking since 1971. That's more than 50 years, actually. In Denmark, we cannot really say that we have anything that resembles what uh, they're trying to do in Wales and in Finland. And this was part of the motivation for the Vision 2050 initiative to create this new vision for Denmark's future. So the pictures you see here, not only are they in black and white, they also exclusively represent older white men, which of course gives a contemporary correct picture. But nonetheless, The Danish welfare state as we know it today, it didn't come out of nowhere. And these people were some of the architects, some of the thinkers behind um, the Danish welfare state as we know it today, at least in terms of the visionary thinking that goes behind it. So the Vision Denmark 20, 2050 initiative was actually inspired by this. It was inspired by the discussions that took place through the 1950s and 60s between politicians, artists, writers, scientists and academics and even business people, which went on to become the basis for the development of the welfare society that we're so proud of in the 20th century. At the time, the close dialogue across sectors and across disciplines, they aimed to define what characterizes the good society. And now, I think we can all agree that we see a pressing need to create a new vision for Denmark's future, to future-proof our Danish welfare society, so that we're fully prepared to overcome future challenges and consolidate the prosperity of Denmark in a future that we know will look significantly different from today. If we want a strong and a healthy and a prosperous society in the future, we need to take action, we need to be proactive, And we need to reinvent ourselves as a nation and have a clear direction for where we, where we are going. 
Dasha will dive much more into the actual outcomes and aspirations of uh, the Vision 2050 uh, a little bit later on, but please allow me to take you through the actual process on a very overall level. It was a very, very extensive process involving a load, a huge, uh, huge amount of stakeholders and uh, and uh, different participants in in workshops and, and and interviews and whatnot. But I would claim that the very first step in any visioning process is obviously selecting the core group of participants that we need to get involved, right? Both the process of developing a shared vision, but definitely also the process of understanding the future that we are applying our visioning to. That should be seen as, and approached, I would say, as a form of collective intelligence that can only be generated through dialogue and exchange between people that brings diverse perspectives to the table. You would say as non-partisan as possible, even though it's difficult. It simply isn't possible, I would claim, to passively just study the future or do the visioning or come up with anything worthwhile uh, on your own. I would say that our approach was very much what you would call a think tank model, where we brought together a, rain, a range of representatives across sectors in society, high level and very visionary people across business and entrepreneurship, across science, people from education, people representing arts and culture and even civil society. And the core ambition here was to put together a group of people that would be able to contribute to the vision, to the future vision based on what we would say would be sound knowledge, obviously creative imagination, multidisciplinarity and well-founded views. So putting together the right group of people put a lot of thinking into what constitute the right group of people and who um, should be involved when, when in the process is extremely, um, extremely important to any visioning process. Then we went ahead to gather perspectives from an even wider group of people through interviews, through stakeholder um, engagement, before we even assembled the group for the first time. Then it was time to get people together for the first workshop. We did that before the summer of 2021. It was very, very intimidating and very challenging. And the first workshop, we focused very much on understanding the megatrends and understanding the dynamics of change that would shape people's lives, that would shape the Danish society and obviously also Denmark as a nation in the world towards 2050. Then we also wanted to focus on debating which core values, which core Danish values that we would want to uphold in any given future and also different vision elements that should take center stage in the vision. I would say that we were very focused on facilitating the workshop in the way that nurtured participants' mental flexibility, I would say, to avoid this, this path dependency thinking that I was talking about earlier. And as this was a workshop with an explorative focus, one of the tricks were to mix people across the sectors and across the disciplines in the debates and in the workshop activities. So we had conversations, we had debates, we had a very explorative workshop in the very first workshop that we did. Workshop two, we were trying to narrow down a little bit more to, to come up with concrete actions and aspirations. So after the summer for workshop two, it was much less explorative in the sense that it was focused on concrete and credible aspirations and actions that would lead us towards this vision. This time around, we actually had people work with their peers on aspirations and actions that were related much more to their main area of expertise. So we wouldn't have, have business people discussing the future of arts and culture, for example, aspirations and actions around that, vice versa, right? Then we spent some time after the two workshops on compiling all the input, the immense input from the process, and we spent some time on writing up the actual vision document, which was followed by an iterative process to vet the final vision. A lot of back and forth, so we had all the stakeholders being able to sign off um, on a vision that we could bring forward. And now the vision has been presented to the Danish government. 
to leading Danish interest organizations, and of course also to the wider Danish public. And this is an ongoing process. Dasha will get back to that much more. All right, so let me leave you with something that I think applies to all future visioning. Einstein famously said that the future is a product of our thinking and we cannot change the future without changing the way that we think, loosely translated. I think that goes center stage to any uh, future visioning exercise out there. We need to be able to change our current thinking. We need to be able to look at the future in new ways to be able to better understand the future visionary conditions to relate it to the vision that we are trying to do. All right, that was a lot of me talking. We've reached the point where it's time for the very first short exercise. So we have a mirror board ready for you. The link should be in the chat. And it's a pretty simple exercise. We call it a vision at lip. We want all of you to highlight three key aspirations that you believe should be included in a vision 2050 for your country. So we're very much looking forward to see all of the interesting things you come up with. And after the seminar, I promise you that after the seminar, we'll compile all of your input and share it back to you with, back to all of you in a neat little format that, uh, that we'll come up with. So please go ahead, navigate to the mirror board, find the canvas with your name on it. And a disclaimer here would be that um, we haven't really arranged your names or your canvases in alphabetical order. Sorry about that. So you'll need to navigate around a little bit and find your canvas with your name on it. If you're in doubt of what, it, what, what we want you to do here, you, there's also a slide on the canvas where you, that you can refer to where you see um, the exercise explained. So please go ahead, navigate to the mirror board, find the canvas with your name on it, and spend the next 10 minutes on thinking about key aspirations for a vision 2050 for your country. Looking very much forward to see what you come up with. Welcome back. I have taken over for Simon. Um, I couldn't help watching what you guys were doing in Miro while, uh, while you were working. And it looks, one, it looks like a very engaging exercise. I hope you found it just as interesting as it was difficult. Um, at the same time, I can see, and we've been sneak peeking into some of the visions and aspirations you've been, you've been working on, that it corresponds quite well and echoes with what I'm about to present to you in a second. And that's a little bit more detail onto the, um, onto the process that we went through and the vision that we arrived at and the aspirations that we then uh, discovered were relevant in order to support this. So without further ado, I would like to take you through some of the details of our vision Denmark 2050 and some of the building blocks that are just not, not only making it more real, but also hopefully tangible and doable. First of all, as Simon alluded to, we had a lot of people in the room and we had everything from artists to scientists to business people, entrepreneurs, etc. And everybody had a different path towards uh, where they were at the time, but also the past that they envisioned for the country. So for us to arrive at something that everybody could agree on, we, on the one side, we agreed that we're living in a world that is trans centrifuging apart, be it in individuals, be it in societies. We see polarization increasing internally and externally, and we see regional forces pulling the world a little bit apart. So what became the vision tagline was that we need to stay connected. So connectedness became the overarching word. But not just connected as such, we need to also be connected to nature. And as we've seen over the last at least decade and uh, the latest years in particular, there is a bigger and bigger focus for us to understand that as humans, we are part of a bigger ecosystem. So connectedness with nature, connectedness with each other, because no man is an island. And whether it's in society or just as, as an individual, whether it's loneliness or it's how you feed into the overall economy or how you then receive something back from, from the state you live in. That's also important. And last but not least, we need to be connected with the world and the world needs to be connected internally because if climate change is not an example of something that happens locally but impacts globally, then at least the, some of the rising tensions and conflicts we're seeing right now, nothing is contained within a geography. So connectedness to nature, each other and the world became our tagline. But taglines are nice. Uh, they're also very 
positive. They're also somewhat in concrete. So we had to take it a step further, and this is where we came up with the themes. So we took it to another level. We said, well, for one, it requires that Denmark in 2050 is future-proofed. And by future-proof, we mean it needs to be not only socially stable and sustainable. It also needs to be economically well-funded, etc. So it has to be future-proofed in a way that whatever we do now ensures that generations to follow can benefit from the same um, benef can benefit from the same society that we had. Next, we had we next next we came up with united and tolerant. So we need a, a country that may be heterogeneous, but it has to be somewhat in harmony. It's it, we need to move in unity in order to move something, and in order to move in unity and be different, you need tolerance. So that became a second theme. The third theme was we need a meaningful life. So whatever Denmark we're envisioning 30 years from now, it has to encompass a meaningful life from the moment we're born until we leave it. And that's something that was extremely uh, important to everyone who participated in the work streams. We also need to be open. And it was a little bit controversial to discuss openness at a time where countries seem to be closing in on themselves. Alliances are strengthening at the same time. Uh, we're wedging bigger, um, if not conflicts, there are at least differences with everything around us. But we need the world to be open because that's what has given us prosperity. That's what's given us peace. And everything we enjoy about the world today actually comes from, from a time where it was more open. And then last but not least, we need to be educated. And this is not just academically. This is also culturally and this is socially. So we need to... If not raise the bar, then at least maintain it in terms of how we have a public dialogue and how we ensure that everybody is on, on, uh, on at least a minimal level with of opportunities and potential. But none of that is achievable without the foundation. And here we said, well, if we don't achieve this in a sustainable manner, and if we don't manage to embrace technology in a sustainable manner, and here means socially coherent and sustainable, well, none of, the, none of the above is going to transpire. So we took this as a foundation, which means we didn't spend much time on going into the details of it during the workshops, because we took it as a given for one, and second, no one in the room, or at least not many people in the room, would be fully equipped to discuss this in detail, because there are so many experts out there dealing with these two particular topics. So they were the foundation. And this is where we look 30 years out. And very few could disagree with the tagline, the vision itself, the themes, the foundation. But then the question is, had we left it at that, um, we would probably be nowhere. Or at least we would, we would stay on this aspirational level, just leave it, leave it be and then move on. So we had to come up with the pillars, as we call them. So we split our road towards 2015 to 10-year periods. And for the next 10 years, the people that were in the room had some sort of agency, if not to take on some of these pillars themselves, then at least to influence the people within their own network uh, and, so, I guess, societal sphere. So we decided to break it down to eight pillars that we would try and pursue for the next 10 years. This is where we get a little bit more concrete. So one, uh, we have a society, again, that is anchored in a meaningful life, and I'll get a little bit more into that. The second part was that we champion democratic principles, um, solidarity, and active citizenry. For the next 10 years, we also want to have education as a supporting pillar to people realizing their potential, regardless of, of uh, say, a geographic origin or some sort of social dependencies. We also want to play a more active role, maybe even a small role, we're a small country, but we want to be sure that we play the active role that we can in ensuring that international collaboration and cooperation continues and is being threatened in a world that is actually spinning a little bit apart. But in order to do all this, we do need a healthy business life, we need healthy uh, industries, sectors, we also need entrepreneurship and innovation because some, all of this has to be funded somehow, and that means it has to be anchored in a sustainable model in terms of our businesses. To do that, we're going to have to start exchanging more talent with the world. And that means Danes going abroad, bringing back experiences, bringing back new thoughts, but it also means welcoming talent uh, and a labor force coming from the outside because that's the only way that we actually learn from each other. So this speaks to the openness of, of Denmark in 2030. And then, of course, we need to... We want to be a leading country in innovation and research within the fields where we actually have a stronghold right now. And then last but not least, as I said, we need to feed into the world in a positive manner. So whatever it is we manage to achieve through all the seven pillars, we need to make sure that it also benefits the rest of the globe and feeds in to some of the solutions to some of the more global challenges. So this is maybe a more traditional um, strategy house, if you will, if you've seen management consultants present this kind of structure before. But for us, it was a very important structure because we have the vision 
We have the themes, they're a little bit more tangible. We have a foundation without which none of this will happen. But in order to make it more concrete, for the next 10 years, we are focusing on these eight pillars. And should we double click on the eight pillars, and I'll do that in a little bit on a high level, um, we're also going to see that all of this is underpinned by 130 much more concrete suggestions for how to achieve this. So this is not just, okay, here are the eight, everybody try and, uh, try and do whatever you can. So we actually break it down into 130 very concrete suggestions for how some of this can be achieved over the next 10 years. The first one, and I'm going to run through this very quickly so you get the highlights of the report. Uh, so the first one was that we want our society to be characterized by a meaningful life throughout life. And that, of course, starts with the young ones. We want to be the best country in the world in which you want to be a child and grow up. We want to make sure that our youth is, uh, our youth is, take, uh, is not taken care of, but at least that our youth is somehow lifted out of this uh, dive we're seeing into be it loneliness and depression and just deteriorating mental health. And once they become young adults and they enter the labor market, we want to make sure that we have a flexible working culture, one where you can be a parent or you can do something else and you want to find some sort of balance in your life. And we, want a, we want a labor market that can cater to this up and down scaling throughout your life. Then at some point you may enter an age where you're either retired or elderly and the latest debate, at least in Denmark, has been that we somehow almost decommission people um, and and. and deteriorate their worth just because they turn a certain age and there's so much more to be done to make sure that we we treat the elderly with the respect they deserve but also as an asset in society rather than a burden all of this is of course supported by healthcare system and one of the things that we need to do in the next 10 years is move from just treating people but to also preventing them to be from being sick and that's something we're working on on the side and then last but not least, we believe that the cultural element needs to transpire through everything. So we want to make sure that everybody growing up has access to arts and culture throughout their life. The second one was that Denmark is a leading country within democratic principles, solidarity and active citizenship. Um, and for one, we want the Danes to continue to have this strong sense of community, unions, volunteering. It's a movement and it's a structure that is extremely strong in Denmark. So people volunteering in all sorts of organizations is truly a pillar of society. Um, we want to make sure that we protect our democracy, that we strengthen it, that we one measure could be that we have high vote turnout for, for any elections that we have. But democracy is a true pillar. In, in the liberal democracies that we see across the globe, but also the one we want to be in 30 and then for, uh, 10 years, of course. We need to get polarization down uh, and we want to make sure that social mobility is going up. So one thing we realized, there was a report out uh, earlier last year, I think, where unfortunately some of this self-perception that we have in Denmark, that we have high level of social mobility, that was actually debunked. And it turns out that it's not as good as we want it to be. But in order to have this coherence, in order to have harmony in heterogeneity, we need to make sure that polarization is, is kept at bay and we need to make sure that social mobility is increased. And this is what one of the things we can do is to make sure that we have equal access to digital tools and services. And this is from everything that everybody has um, good internet access, but also that we actually educate people so we don't leave someone behind in the digital transformation. And then, of course, we need societal trust. Um, the Nordics have done quite well throughout the pandemic. And one of the reasons being is that we have high trust in both institutions, but also authorities, uh, rules, etc. So we need to make sure that that trust is maintained, valued by those in power, but also maintained. We need the education system to help us realize potential. And this is from we start in school and until we go into lifelong learning. So we need to make sure that no child is left behind and that no, no child is leaving the primary school stage without having the basic competencies to, to move on in life. We also need to make sure the public schools are strengthened. In Denmark, we have a very strong tradition of having public schools. Uh, but as of late, we've seen the development of, of, of uh, parents increasingly taking their children from the public schools and moving them into private schools for various reasons. But it has an element of making sure that we meet different people every day. So from, from the moment we're children, we get exposed to different sides of society, people who come from different upbringings, different cultures. And that's something that happens in a public school. So we need to make sure that that, be, that remains a valid and attractive uh, alternative for parents. We need less of our youth to be left with nothing. By the time they leave their, their prime education, they cannot be left in a void. They need to be either progressed into education or employment or something else in order for them not to feel the loneliness that we discussed before. Same happens when you're educated 
and you come out of an academic background, you cannot be left outside the workforce. And then lifelong learning. So if we can't stress this enough that any degree that our parents, my mother achieved 30 years ago, almost 50 years ago now, I mean, it's not irrelevant, but technology for one has moved on. So we need to make sure that lifelong learning is a part of our education system. We discussed this before, so we need to make sure that we strengthen the international collaboration. And that's one, we have to support the alliances that we're in. And that means full-heartedly support and enjoy the, the, um, the leverage it gives us internationally, but also to make sure that we are not the ones to at least erode any of the fragile um, strength that they have already. And then last but not least, we also need to, of course, fully support um, diplomatic uh, diplomatic initiatives and international uh, uh, international agreements in order to make sure that we have a world order which is actually predictable and in which we can operate not just as individuals but as, as businesses. We have a healthy and competitive business life and this was a little bit contagious because people were discussing whether everything is always about money. It's not. But if we double click on anything, be it society, be it health, be it the youth, the kindergartens, etc. Or being able to take, take time off work and stay home with your children. In the end, you need some sort of funding to support it. It's public budgets and all of this has to work. So yes, you cannot discuss a future without discussing business. And uh, we need to make sure that entrepreneurship is presented as a viable source, uh, as a viable way forward. It's not, it shouldn't be as risky as it is and it shouldn't be as, adventurous is good, but not if it comes as a risk to yourself. So entrepreneurship has to be, uh, has to be delivered as a message of something you can actually do. We need a regulatory framework that makes it predictable for businesses to operate. We need it to be attractive so for people to actually come to Denmark and start, have and grow a business. And this is everything from tax regimes to red tape to ease of doing business uh, credits, etc. Now, we, um, we also want to be in the top 10 in terms of gender equality and equal pay. And this is not just because it's a societal responsibility to move into the 21st century, as Simon showed in the beginning. It was a certain group that did this the first time around mid last century, and they were in a position of power for a reason. It made sense at the time. But if we want a different set group to, make, to pave the way forward, we're going to have to address some of these issues and we want to be in the global top 10. And then, of course, we want to have the best labor market. We want people to, one, enjoy being here. We want people who were born and raised here to want to come back and work. And, and, of course, we want to make sure that people, everybody feels included and feel that they have full access to the flexibility. We make sure that people go abroad uh, and we, make, we have to make sure that people come back and we have to make sure that we're more open as a society to welcome any newcomers because it is an absolute benefit and it's a brain gain. We have to make sure not to brain drain everything around us, but this exchange of talent, this exchange of knowledge, this challenge from a different culture in a globalized world is absolutely invaluable. Um, and then of course we want to have a culture that we're proud of ourselves, but also one that respects others because that makes it an easier place to welcome others and it makes it a far better ambassadorship that we take with us into the world. This is, of course, very ambitious, but we are a small country. We're a bumblebee economy. We shouldn't fly, but we do. And part of that is this, this entrepreneurial innovation spirit that we do have. And we have strongholds in certain research areas. And we need to make sure that we continue to have the institutions, educational and research facilities that are, that are going to forge even more of these strongholds going forward. Um, and then, of course, the very unique to a unique but also very strong public-private partnership model that we have in Denmark. The engagement of the funds, just as this project itself, is something that we need to make sure fosters more of this innovation that then leads to export and value creation and jobs. And then last but not least, we need to give back to the world. So not only windmills, etc., but we're very proud of everything we created back in history that we now see portrayed globally, but it needs to continue. So. We need to see more of our solutions and strength go into solving some of the problems that we have. And the UN has done us all a favor by defining 17. So we have the 17 SDGs and it's a good place to start to see how we can apply some of the things that we do here. And then, of course, we need to lead by example. We are 0.1% uh, of the global emissions. We know we're not going to change the world by our behavior alone, but I think leading the way showing that we can do this, showing a different way of conducting a society is something that can inspire others and potentially become something we can portray elsewhere. Right? Now, so I've taken you a little bit from the vision and the bigger picture and then back to the present. And we want you to do a little bit of the same. So we're going to do something called backcasting. You have another canvas. Um, 
to your right. I see some of you actually already started on that canvas, but that's great. So you can revisit or add something else. But the way this works is that you go to your aspiration. And I've seen some of you, again, echo ours. And then you try and walk it back and say, how could that actually become a reality? So for us, it could be some of the points that I mentioned. So we had... Um, uh, we had a vision and then we would take it back and say we need to be in the global, global top 10 in terms, of, uh, in terms of equal pay and gender diversity. So that would lead to a more meaningful life, better labor force. Or it was the pillar that we called open. This is where we um, this is where try to engage with the external world and make sure that we, we support the alliances internationally. Something like this. So be a little bit more concrete. This is where the rubber hits the road. This is where you get to see whether your vision is actually doable. So try and come up with at least two or three of these backcasting elements. So what are the stepping stones towards your big aspiration? And we're going to give you another 10, 12 minutes and then we're going to break in and I'm going to wrap up the session. So go to the right in your mirror board uh, and see how concrete you can get towards the next 30 years. Have fun. Welcome back. Um, we can see on the screen, as we've been following you guys working a little bit live, that a lot, of, a lot of stuff have been done and a lot of things have been written, so that's great. We also hope that you find it, found it a little bit, um, if not tricky, then just interesting to try and actually become more concrete. Meanwhile, uh, I've had the pleasure of bringing back my lovely colleague, Simon, because we've had a question, and it relates a little bit to the part that you discussed. So the question reads, how did you go about creating a progressive dialogue in the mix of people that you gathered in the same room? Yeah, I think part of the answer is actually in uh, the question itself. It was about getting the right mix of people, really. So getting the right people to have the right discussions, if that's what meant, what's, what's meant by progressive. And I think that the, the biggest problem was actually to sort of contain them and contain their discussions uh, in a way. But if progressive is meant as that we progressed through the process and got to the outcomes that we needed to move on, that's something that we do by design. Not only progressing forward, but also progressing in the right direction so that we are sure to leave the workshop or the workshops with what we need to move on in the visioning work. So I would say maybe even that between 50 to 60% of a process like this the, resource, the resources that goes into the, a process, process like this is about designing the right progression and even designing the right temperature around the progression, right? And I think if, if we were, we, we promised a view into the engine room, and I think it's fair to say not only did we spend a lot of time designing, but we spent a lot of time redesigning. So we went back many times and sometimes started completely over because it didn't give us the outcome that we wanted and we would have 50 people in a room. So, so yeah, you're absolutely right. I would say even maybe even more, but yeah. And a small trick to sort of get progressive dialogues in, in the meaning of being progressive um, is that, that when you're discussing the future, forcing people to try and not just extrapolate the current views or using the current frame that they are taught to think within to make sense of the future, but actually switching that around. So we're exploring the future and trying to investigate what that means for the decision we need to make in the presence. It's a little bit more free and it's about this mental flexibility that I talked about a little bit. If we're standing today and trying to make sense of the future, it becomes less progressive. But if we are venturing out into the future and trying to, ma to make sense of what it means to the present, the, the decision that needs to be made in the present, then it easily becomes much more progressive. It has to be. Yeah. <laughs> we will summarize what you done on the board. The mirror board will remain open if you want to go back and revisit uh, or if you want to see what the other we, the other participants have done, we'll keep it open. We'll also take the liberty of looking at it ourselves in more detail and then circle some of that back to you. But for the time being, we would like to just start rounding off. And in summary, just very quickly, how do you go about something like this in general? Well, first of all, visions have to be visionary. That's one. You have to be visionary. You have to leave behind whatever constraints you're seeing in the present and the past. You have to be visionary, but not entirely utopian. And it's okay if utopia in the sense that it's something better than today, but it has to be 
I'm not going to say realistic, but at least in the plausible realm of the future. So it has to be something that is somewhat doable. The second part is you need to imagine the contextual environment of the future. So again, are you still imagining cars, but they're just shaped differently? Or what is it? I mean, what contextual and conditional future is it you're working towards? You have to make sure that you don't underestimate who's in the room. So as Simon said, a big part of the process and the resources we spent behind the scenes was imagining who's going to be in the room, what dialogue could take place, what are people bringing with them. And another thing is you have to remember to, uh, to assess who's not in the room. One, are there any voices missing? If they're missing, is, those, is that someone who will be vocal on the other side of something coming out? Are you going to have buy-in? Are there interests that are not represented that should be? So be very aware of who's in the room, but also be very aware of who's not in the room. And speaking of that, uh, when, you, when you envision a future, it's a very good idea to not just have the usual suspects. And by usual suspects, I mean people in positions of either influence or power today. That makes sense, as we did with the 10-year horizon. They are the ones to make the changes. But if you're going 30 years out, make sure you have someone in the room who will have, say, your age at the time of this future transpiring, because this is the world they will live in. So you need their input as well. So don't succumb to the usual temptation of just having, say, sea level or decision makers only in the room. You need different inputs. Um, Again, visions are very nice and they're necessary, uh, but they need a plan because otherwise they will evaporate back into the space of visionary discussions that they came from. So you need a plan and that's what we did in the backcasting, at least briefly. Because in the end, they're very powerful and they should be bold. So visions have to be bold, but they're only as effective as their roadmaps are concrete. So both are interesting and both are important. The right people in the room, the right conversations, visionary visions that are not fully utopian, but out there. And then a backcasting exercise that makes sure that you actually thought through how you're going to achieve it, because otherwise you'll be sitting there 30 years from now rereading re the document and saying, could have been nice, but we never did anything. I think that's what we had for today. Um, connect on LinkedIn and find Simon and myself and, and the Institute. And I'll flip back to this in a second, because just want to make sure that you guys are aware of the next report and the next theme coming out for the next quarter, and that's entering new age of work. So we're going to talk about the future of work for the next quarter to come. And we're going to do that in our report and through the next three seminars. So tune in on the 2nd of May. Otherwise, um, please connect. Stay with us. We look forward to hear from you if you have any feedback. And otherwise, thank you so much for joining and for playing along in our canvas. And we look forward to see what you guys have done. Thank you.